Okay. Here we go on three. One, two, three. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co hostess with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How are you feeling? A uh, little heartburn, actually. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I mean, I think it's just 40. Um, sure. Uh, but it's also just uh, anticipation of what's to come. Today. Sure. Yeah. Sure. We got, a, we got a beast of an episode this week, I hear. We do. from you it's, it which it's it's a rare one um it's it's probably the longest one i've ever done and listen if you're an og listener you'll know that i tend to be the one that that is got a dickens like verbosity to my or verbosity to my writing um so this is rare it's rare for you to be the one that's uh written something long but i know that this case it's just never ending it's there's so much information oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We could have based our entire podcast around it. I would not do it, but we could have because there's just it's never ending. Yeah. Like there's a the never ending story. I made that bit earlier when my was commenting about uh, the the anxiety I was feeling about this episode. And it, my husband was just like, oh, you've kind of been feeling that for a while <laughs> i did the it's like a never-ending story i absolutely did that's i love it i did i love it yeah. um like minds yeah always some would, some yeah, would like say that. a shared brain oh absolutely yeah we are not a full brain separately <laughs> no <laughs> together maybe yeah yeah Absolutely. Together, one full functioning brain that is also just so anxious. It's it would implode. Um, yeah. Now, listen, quick little update for me, because everyone on this podcast has come along for the, the journey onto into my musical career, whether they like it or not. Oh, of course they love it. So Tuesday morning, I wake up. I know the charts have come out. I set yes. an alarm. And I go through them and there's a lot to go through and I can't find I can't find anything. And I'm like, well, I guess that's it. Guess it didn't happen. On to the next, next time. Huh. And then yesterday, I was uh, in Disneyland for the day, as I am wont to do. And I get an alert that someone tweeted at me. And I'm like, what's this? It's an article from Billboard. First timers who made the Billboard charts. What? And then I realized that when I was going through the charts, there's a whole section of them that I missed on Tuesday morning. Mm-hmm. And I absolutely debuted at number five on the alternative down digital downloads chart and number 14 on the rock song digital downloads chart. How about it? It's exciting. I actually went and cut a little, uh, a little video uh, earlier, which was basically pulling clips of me on this podcast, talking about how I want to be on the billboard charts. Mm -hmm. And then I edited in the chart. Screen grabs. I put that up on the TikTok there. But what a true joy in my life. How about it? You. I said this, this is, is, this is the dream. Stone. It really is. And I thank all of the listeners who supported me and bought the song because that is literally the reason why I'm there was because people yes. bought the song. And for that, I'll be forever grateful. You, you all were a part in helping make my dreams come true. And what a beautiful thing. There's a lot of ugliness in the world. We talk about a lot of it on this show. <laughs> <laughs> but I think a it's a spoiler to today's episode. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I think it's important to recognize the beauty. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. Oh, I think this is great. I love that you had a goal and you fucking went for it. I did. I did. Have it you doesn't made end there. a shirt yet that says something about Billboard? No. Oh, you're right. I should definitely have something that's like, ask me about when I charted on Billboard. <laughs> <laughs> Billboard charting artist. I just felt like, I'm not saying like shirts for everyone. I'm saying like, yeah, because I know sometimes you like to randomly show up and you're in a shirt you've made for yourself. Oh, yeah. and I make them a I lot. I couldn't be happier. So I just thought maybe. I love that, you know. Yes. Oh, that's going to happen because it's the truth. But listen, it's not ending there. It's not ending there. Nope. 
My next single is coming very soon, dangerously soon. It's going to come out June 30th, but the presale date is still in flux. Uh, it'll be sometime next week at, before this airs. So people will probably already know about it if they follow us on the socials. But anyway, sure. let's do it again, folks. Let's yeah. do it again. You oh. do know you have announced the song already, right? Yes. Oh, okay. I just, I just wanted to make sure that you knew you'd already said what it was. I did. And okay. I just said it again. <laughs> I am broken. You're great. You're doing great. You're doing great. Listen, or rather, you're doing the best you can. We're just two women getting by. Getting by. Haven't said that Fair one right. in a while. We haven't. It's no. always nice to re re um it's always nice to revisit some of our older catchphrases. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's nice and comfortable when they come out. It's like a hug. It is. Yep. Like, I don't, when's the last time a bag of worms? Thank you for using it <laughs> as a verb. Like it's a great question. I don't even I know. I like to change it up. Yeah, you know? I do. It's our catchphrase. I can use it however I see it. <laughs> Wasn't accurate the first time I used it. And so I'm going to push it further. And I love that. I love that. Yeah. Yep. Look, it's where I get my yayas today. I it's where you, where you get them or where you get them out. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I uh, I love so much that in reference to you making it a catchphrase, whatever you wanted, you did it again. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I get my yayas. <laughs> I mean, I guess uh, maybe there's a world in which people want to get the yayas, but I thought that sure. the, you know, it's get the yayas out. But I mean, again, it absolutely is. And look, if you think I'm not going to consider after we finish recording going out and then taking that sound bite and st sticking it there. No, we don't do that. We don't. Um, look, I, I've been wading through this world for, oh, probably a week and a half at this Oof. point. And it's, I think it has slowly started to eat my brain. Yep. Shout out to Canadian band The Odds and their hit single, Eat My Brain. I love that. I was like, where are we going with that? I don't know. I Because my ADHD brain, as everyone knows, everything triggers song lyrics. And so I was going to sing that song. And then I was like, that's a specific demographic. I think I'm going to give them just a full shout out. I respect that. Also, yeah. for someone who is like brain constant song lyrics. Yeah. I mean, Billboard was inevitable. Great point. Maybe I should write a song about that. Well, that's how I'll get my yayas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's uh... the best. It's the best. It's just not meaning to is part yep. of the problem yep. uh, or maybe it's part of the magic. I don't know. I can't tell anymore. Yeah. Absolutely. Part of magic. Always. Yeah. Always. Well, listen, before we get into it, cause we're going to jump in fast. Cause there's a lot to get through. What you drinking yeah. over there? Uh, well, I've got a water as a backup. Uh, cause I got a lot of things to say out loud. So I need to keep it wet. Nope. Oh my God. <laughs> need to keep it wet wow okay <laughs> i meant my voice <laughs> fuck well buckle up dear <laughs> listeners uh and then what i shouldn't be doing um uh, i've got a i've got a coke with like a splash of cherry whiskey in there i That's don't know nice. if you can tell i'm out of it you're getting a bit of a flush to you so it feels like yeah. it's uh it's doing the trick it's doing the it trick. is. It is. I also just talked about being wet on the show, which I didn't intend to. Keep it wet, baby. Jesus, what a what a mess. Uh, well, listen over here. I got a water, as always. I got a large diet coke from Chipotle of all places, and a mango high noon. Nice. Yeah. Just keeping it real, you know. Just keeping it real. Well, listen, we're going to dive into this quick, as I said, because we've got so much information to get through. We're, of course, discussing People's Temple on this episode of the podcast. Uh, this was our April patrons poll over on patreon.com 
patreon.com doing great patreon.com slash true crime and cocktails uh we have a subscription-based monthly service where you can vote on an episode that we do once a month here on the main feed of the show we've got bonus episodes we've got live monthly uh q a's all of the above so check that out if you're interested this was of course the winner for april and we are going to get into it right away <clears throat> seems Either like i'm way. keeping it a little too wet <laughs> Oh, my God. Well, here we go. Reverend Jim Jones believed in equality for everyone. He started a church called People's Temple with the mission to feed the hungry, care for the elderly, help those in need, and make the world a better place. And while Jim's initial dream may have been admirable, his addictions to sex, drugs, and power led him astray. Jim's insatiable need for control caused him to create a People's Temple settlement in South America where he planned to isolate his followers to gain their undying devotion. And when Jim became embroiled in a tense custody battle, it set into motion the act of a desperate man who knows that he's going down, so he decides to take hundreds of people with him. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, this, uh... This one's not going to be light. Yeah, unfortunately. I'll say that. I'll say that. Um, so disclaimer, off the top, as always, this episode will contain mentions of suicide, sexual assault, substance abuse, physical abuse, and child death. So trigger warning for those who need it. So Lynette Putnam, who later went by Lynetta for no reason, uh, believed that she was meant for greatness. So around the age of 16, she tried to escape her small town by marrying a man named Cecil Dixon. However, that didn't work out, and they divorced after two years. The following year, Lynetta married Elmer Stevens, but their marriage ended after just three days. In 1926, Lynetta believed that she'd hit the jackpot. James Thurman Jones, a World War I veteran, who had suffered severe damage to his lungs following a German gas attack, was not only single, but he was also from a very wealthy family. Unfortunately for Lynetta, James' family wanted the young couple to earn their own fortune. So instead of giving them a large sum of money or a house, James' father made a down payment on a small farm outside Crete, Indiana, and expected Lynetta and James to work the land themselves. <laughs> However, neither had any farming experience nor the money to hire any help, so they often struggled. And since James was injured, he was unable to work for long periods at a time, which meant Lynetta had to take on extra jobs, and she resented James for it. When Lynetta became pregnant, she thought that surely her wealthy in-laws would finally step in and help her out financially. They did not. And while Lynetta spent most of her life believing that her in-laws hated her, it was actually quite the opposite. James's father was impressed with Lynetta's tenacity and not helping her financially was the father-in-law's way of showing respect. But Lynetta did not see it that way. On May 13, 1931, Lynetta gave birth to James Warren Jones, known as Jim or Jimmy in 1932, Jim's father had a breakdown and needed to be hospitalized for months. Lynetta did the brunt of the child care, even after James returned home. Unfortunately for Jim, Lynetta didn't have much of a maternal instinct, so he spent most of his childhood alone, which caused him to yearn for attention in his adult years. Here we go. He also got away with a lot. Like how he would steal candy bars from a local store, but he never got in trouble for it. Because it turns out that once a week, Lynetta would go to the store and just pay for whatever Jim had taken that week. The idea that Jim believed he could break the rules without facing any consequences and his insatiable hunger for attention were just small glimpses of the man that Jim would later become. Jim grew up in the small town of Lynn, Indiana, where he creeped out other children by holding elaborate funerals for small dead animals. What's worse is the kids say that some of those times, Jim was responsible for the animals' deaths. 
Oh, boy. During World War II, when all the kids his age were playing soldier, Jim was more fascinated with Hitler and the pageantry of the Nazis, especially how large masses were obedient to a single man. Again, it's definitely foreshadowing as to what Jim would be like as an adult. A few other random things about Jim that are worth noting. In school, Jim had a complete disregard for authorities, as he often challenged teachers. He also stood out because he chose to wear his Sunday best every day of the week, and because he refused to speak to kids who spoke to him first and would only respond to somebody if Jim was the one to speak to them first. Yep. He believed even from a young age that he was destined for greatness, so he had plans to become a minister. In the summer of 1948, Jim and his mother moved 16 miles or 26 kilometers south to Richmond. In December of that same year, Jim graduated from Richmond High School six months before the rest of the senior class. After graduation, Jim worked at Reed Memorial Hospital as a night orderly. He seemed to have a gift for the work and quickly impressed the senior staff, and it was at Reed Hospital where Jim would meet his future wife. Marceline May Baldwin was born January 8, 1927. Not much is known about Marceline's childhood, but she was described by many as loyal, kind, gentle, and a giving person. When Marceline was a senior nursing student in late 1948, she asked for an orderly to help her prepare a corpse. The orderly they gave her was Jim Jones. And while Marceline was 21 and Jim was just 17, they quickly fell in love. Which, yeah, gross, but it's it's interesting that it's gone the other way this time. Yeah. You know? We're always so often the other way. Yeah. Uh, in January 1949, Jim resigned from Reed Memorial and moved to Bloomington, where he started taking classes at the University of Indiana. Six months later, Jim and Marceline were married on June 12th in a double wedding with Marceline's sister Eloise and her husband, Dale Klingman. Soon after, Marceline's parents said they didn't believe that people from different races should ever get married. Not sure how the topic came up. But Jim became so angry that Marceline wasn't allowed to contact her family for years. And honestly, it's one that's one thing about Jim that I respect his true belief that everyone, regardless as to race, should be treated as we equal. It doesn't make up for the horrific things he eventually did. But at first, Jim seemed like he had a genuinely positive message. In May 1951, Jim's father... Uh, died from respiratory disease at the age of 63. According to author Jeff Gwynn, quote, no one recalls seeing Lynetta or Jimmy at the funeral. But it wasn't long before Lynetta applied for a widow's claim on her husband's army pension. And speaking of Jeff Gwynn, he wrote a book called The Road to Jonestown, Jim Jones and People's Temple. Uh, I read it as part of my research for the episode. If you're looking for more details about the story, I recommend it. It is a horror show due to the subject matter, but I mean that you'll find out shortly enough. In the summer of 1952, Jim was hired as a student pastor at the Somerset Methodist Church in Indianapolis. And while he performs sermons there every Sunday on Saturdays and weeknights, Jim did revivals and prayer meetings in tents and fields outside of small towns throughout Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, and Ohio. And when I say revivals, I'm talking the exact stereotype you see in movies, loud, joyous music, a large, passionate audience, and a preacher claiming to have healed people with the simple power of prayer. But I will get into his revivals more later on. Then came a time when Marceline's nine-year-old cousin, Ronnie, needed a home. His father died when he was just four, and his mother was considered to be unstable. So Ronnie went to live with Jim and Marceline. After a year, the couple planned to officially adopt Ronnie. However, Ronnie said no, because he wanted to be reunited with his mother and two brothers. Marceline was disappointed, but Jim was outraged and immediately sent the child back to live with his mother, whether she was ready or not. But by then, Ronnie's mother had improved and the family thrived. But Jim 
was still angry, so he contacted Ronnie's school and spoke with the principal, trying to convince Ronnie to come back and live with him instead. Ronnie again refused. It got to the point where Ronnie was outright terrified of Jim and ran away from him at a family gathering because he just couldn't stand to be near him. Without Ronnie in their life, Jim and Marceline decided they wanted to add to their family, but since Marceline had medical issues stemming from her childhood, it was believed that pregnancy wouldn't be an option. So in 1954, Jim and Marceline adopted an 11-year-old girl named Agnes Pauline. Also in 1954, Jim and Somerset Church decided to part ways. If you ask Jim, he'd say he was asked to leave after trying to bring African Americans into the congregation. But if you ask Somerset, they'd say that Jim was let go after members accused him of lying and stealing money. But I'll let you decide who you think was telling the truth. Spoiler alert, it wasn't Jim. Jim didn't let his dismissal get him down. He decided that instead of going to work for another church, he'd just start his own. It was initially called Community Unity until Jim purchased a building at 10th and Delaware Streets, which had the word temple carved in stone outside. Jim wanted the name of his church to reflect both the word temple as well as his own philosophy, so it became People's Temple. And to be clear, there is no apostrophe in People's as the apostrophe symbolized ownership, and Jim's goal was to rid people of their obsession with material possessions. And I, I got to tell you, nothing drives me crazy, quite like getting rid of that apostrophe for someone trying to type that word out repeatedly. But I digress. That's <laughs> the lowest level thing he's done. He does that makes me angry. But <laughs> The apostrophe is the yeah. real thing that upsets you. Sure. Yeah, it, it, like, currently. Currently, it's the worst thing he did. After that, it gets, it's just, I, after he removed the apostrophe, it was all downhill from there. Of course. I and mean, let that, that be a lesson. Stick to grammar. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was there was the animal death before that. Okay, he's always been bad. Yeah, he's been bad. Is. Always bad. Uh, soon, it wasn't enough for Jim to be just the leader of People's Temple. He wanted to be someone who could affect real change in the city. Although, if you ask me, it was more like the beginning of Jim's insatiable thirst for power. Which, if you know this story already, you know no amount was ever going to be enough for him. Jim started to take an interest in civic issues like street repair, school maintenance, and zoning issues. He noticed that the city's African-American community didn't have adequate input when it came to these issues. And as you may recall, Jim's initial platform on his rise to power was that everyone, regardless of race, be treated equal. The problem was Jim didn't know how to make politicians and people in positions of power do the things he wanted them to do. Enter Marceline. As the child of a former city councilman, Marceline knew exactly what to do. She started attending every local meeting she could with neighbors, neighborhood associations, school administration, city councils, all of it. Jim didn't attend any. As it was said, he didn't have the patience for any meeting where he wasn't the featured speaker. Yeah. Uh, which screams volumes about Jim's personality. Marceline took notes on the issues. She read through policies and then taught Jim what she had learned. So when Jim finally did show up at a meeting, people were super impressed because Jim had educated suggestions and a solid understanding of the issues and while Marceline did all the work, Jim got all the credit and a boost to his reputation within the community. As People's Temple grew, many of their members were senior citizens who ended up in publicly funded nursing homes. When Jim and Marceline visited, they said the conditions were deplorable and they couldn't stand by and watch their members suffer. So they decided to renovate their own house so it would qualify for certification. And soon, with the help of their assistant, Esther Mueller, they took in several elderly temple members as live-in patients, which means they received money from the government. And shockingly, at the time, it was legit. Jim and Marceline genuinely cared about these people and wanted to see them properly cared for. 
The House received regular visits from Marion County welfare inspectors who were very impressed with the setup, especially with Marceline, who they said was kind and very competent. But the Jones House could only take in so many patients, so they formed a corporation and took over several nursing homes. This not only provided jobs for Temple members, but it also helped bring in money for various Temple programs. With the money, Jim was able to buy radio time on local stations, where he was given 15 minutes every weekday to spread his gospel. The money from the nursing homes also allowed Jim to open a cafe, which he called the Free Restaurant. As the name suggests, people were able to eat there for free. On the first day, they served 18 people. The second day, they served nearly 100. Soon, the restaurant was feeding about 3,000 people a week. Uh, people who were invited to choose, people were also invited to choose from a selection of secondhand clothing. The temple had children's programs, including dance troops and a children's choir, all of which was organized by Marceline, as she had a deep love of children. For the adult members, Jim urged them to vote, helping them with everything from registration to transportation to the polls. So at this point, People's Temple seemed like a positive thing. Its main focus was racial equality and helping the less fortunate. And if that had been enough for Jim, then People's Temple would likely still be around. But as I alluded to earlier, nothing was ever enough for Jim Jones. Enter Father Divine. Now, no one knows for sure, but it is estimated that Father Divine was a man named George Baker, who was born around 1876 in Rockville, Maryland. For the sake of consistency, I'm just going to keep referring to him as Father Divine. Uh, sometimes Divine, because just saying Father weirds me out. It's fine. Around 1912, Father Divine started referring to himself as the messenger and set out to spread his gospel that true heaven could only be found on earth. He started saying that he was God, and he had the power to heal, which gained him a mass of loyal followers. Divine moved from Harlem, where he found housing for his followers, in exchange for them following his strict rules. No swearing, no smoking, no drinking, and no sex. Divine claimed to or claimed to follow his own rules, saying that while he was married to his wife Panina, it was only a spiritual union, and they had never com consummated that relationship. I am, of course, immediately skeptical, but there is no way to know for sure. Allegedly, there were rumors that Divine was being improper with young female followers, so somewhere around 1915, Divine married Panina, who was an older female follower, potentially just to stop the rumor mill. Divine then created a work collective where he placed his followers into various jobs where the money was all pooled together to cover expenses like food, shelter, and clothing. He then expanded the collect collective to include job training and physical therapy for those who needed it, Soon, his collective owned hotels and restaurants where the less fortunate paid whatever they could. By 1920, the man was now going by Father Divine, had thousands of followers all living together in a commune in Sayville, New York. When Father Divine toured the revival circuit, he drew sellout crowds across the country, and soon there were offshoots of the Sayville commune known as Peace Missions. At one point, disillusioned members went to the police and claimed that they'd been mistreated. Like most men in power, Divine said the claims were all just lies. But in 1932, he was convicted of fraud and sentenced to one year in prison. However, he was released a few weeks later for no reason. Soon after, Father Divine's movement bought a ton of farmland in Ulster County, New York, which they named the Promised Land. There, Divine's group made their own food to try and make themselves completely self-sufficient. In 1942, another former member of Divine's flock accused him of stealing money and property from her. A judge ruled in the member's favor, so Divine moved to Philadelphia. <laughs> it, oh, I stole from you, and they know? Ah, I guess we're getting out of town. Jeez. 
But soon, Divine's wife Panina became ill. But Father Divine was a healer. He proved it at his revival shows. Unfortunately, he was unable to heal his wife, and Panina died in 1943. But when Divine secretly got married in April of 1946, it had to be kept on the down low, mainly because he still hadn't publicly announced the death of his first wife. Uh, and another issue, his first wife was an older African-American woman. His second wife was a much, much, much younger white girl from Canada. Oh, boy. Yeah. Divine had concerns that his mostly African-American following wouldn't take kindly to his sudden marriage. But in August 1946, Father Divine introduced his new wife, whom he claimed was still his first wife. No, stop. Are you confused? Well, Divine claims that when he promised to heal his sick wife, he hadn't failed because Panina had simply decided to move her spirit from her older body into her new one. Therefore, his new wife, despite being vastly different, was really still his first wife. So Divine requested his followers refer to his new wife as Mother Divine. Conveniently, Father Divine then started talking about re reincarnation in his sermons, almost as an afterthought and to somehow justify these claims. And I will admit, I am a believer in reincarnation, but what I don't believe is the idea that a spirit entered the body of a person who was alive for many years at that point. Yeah. Divine's new wife was born Edna Rose Richings in April 1925 in Vancouver, British Columbia. At the age of 15, she became fascinated with Father Divine's sermons and left her job as a stenographer in early 1946 and traveled to Philadelphia in the hopes of meeting him. Which she did, and then somehow she just almost immediately married him. At the time of their marriage, Edna was 21. Divine was about 70. Oh, God. He claims they never had sex. I don't believe that. But, you know, I could be wrong. Uh, but the new Mother Divine, or rather Mother in her new form, was far more active in the movement and soon became beloved by the hundreds of thousands of followers. By 1953, the Divines were living in a massive mansion in an upscale Philadelphia suburb while they controlled every aspect of their followers' lives. Around 1956, Jim Jones requested a meeting with Father Divine. After all, Father Divine was doing everything Jim was doing with People's Temple, but Father Divine was doing it bigger and better, and Jim wanted to know how. His biggest interests were in the movement-run businesses and the communal living. After the meeting, Jim adopted some of Divine's practices, including asking members to refer to him and Marceline as father and mother. Jim also changed up his sermons and started to push the idea that the devil was everywhere trying to undo the Lord's work. Jim then decided that his public image as a happy family man was critical to his success, so he suggested that he and Marceline should add more children to their family through adoption. And that's when Jim got the idea of a rainbow family. Jim wanted to show his followers just how much he believed in race equality, so he wanted to adopt children from as many different races as possible. In October 1958, Jim and Marceline traveled to California, where they adopted two Korean Am American orphans, a four-year-old girl they named Stephanie, and a two-year-old boy they named Lou Eric. Soon after, Marceline discovered she was pregnant. In May 1959, while Marceline was bedridden due to her pregnancy, Jim took their other children and a group of members on a weekend trip to the zoo in Cincinnati. On the way home, Stephanie Jones was traveling in a vehicle with other members when their car was hit by a drunk driver. Six members of People's Temple were killed in the accident, including Mabel Stewart, Barbara Payne, Pearl Nance, Dallas Johnson, Robert Zinser, 
and four-year-old Stephanie Jones. Jim and Marceline were, of course, devastated. Three weeks later, Marceline gave birth to Stephen Gandhi Jones. And while it is pronounced Stephen, it is spelt with an A-N at the end in Stephanie's honor. So it basically looks like Stephanie, right? Uh, soon after, they contacted the adoption agency in California, where they learned that Stephanie had a six-year-old sister who was living in a Korean orphanage. The Jones immediately adopted the girl and named her Suzanne. In November 1961, Jim and Marceline decided to adopt once more, so they visited a local orphanage with the plans to adopt another girl. While they are uh, while they were visiting, an African-American baby boy started crying. No one was around, so Marceline picked the baby up, and he stopped crying. They knew immediately that this child was meant to be their son, but at the time, the state of Indiana frowned upon interracial adoption. But the Jones said fuck it and became the first white couple in the state to adopt an African-American child. And probably as a further fuck you to the system, they named him Jim Jones Jr. Again, at this point, I'm on board with Jim's beliefs. But this is basically the point where he loses me. <laughs> so, uh, had me and then you lost me. Uh, something worth noting, because there was nowhere else to put it in my notes. Uh, Timothy Tupper, the child of a member, started to live with the Jones family at one point. Eventually, they legally adopted him around 1972 when Timothy was about 13. So 1961 was a big year for the Jones. Not only did they welcome Jim Jr. to the family, but Jim also took on the role of director of the Indianapolis Human Rights Commission. The job was said to be more of an honorary role, but Jim didn't shy away from the $7,000 annual salary which is equivalent to about 71000 in 2023. 1961 was also the same year that Jim started receiving anonymous threats, so he made sure to have guns in the house to protect himself. One night while his family was sleeping, Jim claims he heard multiple gunshots. When he went outside, he found a bullet hole in a pillar on his porch. Jim called the police, who questioned the entire thing, like how none of the family's three dogs reacted to this alleged shooter and how based on the angle of the bullet hole, the bullet seemed more likely to have been fired from the house, not towards it. Jim, of course, told the congregation he'd been shot at because of the good work he was trying to do for the oppressed. He claimed that he was only alive because of God's protection then he took it up a notch and started pushing the fear of nuclear war. <laughs> oh, my God. Since the Soviet Union's successful series of nuclear tests in 1955, America had been bracing for a full-on nuclear attack. And I would like to shout out the love of my life, the 1982 classic Grease 2, for making me inappropriately giggle every time I hear the word nuclear, because in my head, I hear the T-birds pronounce it nucleoid. Every single time, it is a gift in my life. We're lucky I can say it on this show without it always being nucleoid. It's a nucleoid shelter. I, it's my favorite thing in the world. Anyhow, in June 1961, President John F. Kennedy made a national television address stating that Americans should be prepared in the event of a nuclear attack. So months later, Jim started pushing the idea of this potential attack claiming he had a vision of a future nuclear attack. He believed the attack would come on the 16th. Ah, oh, but he didn't know what month or what year. But he knew it would definitely happen at 3.09. Ah, oh, but he didn't know if that was a.m. or p.m. He also added that several major cities would be targeted, including Chicago, but that Indianapolis would be obliterated. It, his word choices. so specific right like yeah. it's like oh that's exactly the target that so many different countries are coming for indianapolis oh 100 percent uh to help ease the fears of his followers jim said he would search the world for a place where people's temple would be safe and thanks to an issue of esquire magazine 
he knew just where to look in the January 19 to 1962 issue, which technically released in December 1961, Esquire published an article called Nine Places in the World to Hide. Again, the thought of nuclear war uh, had everybody freaking out. It's like back in the early days of COVID when we were all washing our groceries, you know? Yes. So basically just a low-level constant fear of death, <laughs> basically. In the case of nuclear war, it would destroy most of the life on the planet. So this article used wind and weather projections and scientist recommendations to identify the places where the post-nuclear survival was most likely. Those nine places include Eureka, California, Cork, Ireland, Guadalajara, Mexico, Mendoza, Argentina, Chile's or Chile, uh, Chile's Central Valley, Belo Horizonte, Brazil, oh boy, uh, Antanarivo, Madagascar, Melbourne, Australia, and Christchurch, New Zealand. Bowza, that was tougher to get through than I thought. So, for the sake of his followers, Jim took a sabbatical from People's Temple to find a safe place for them to live. He left loyal follower Reverend Russell Winberg in charge while he was gone. Winberg was a minister at the Laurel Street Tabernacle who met Jim in 1954. So with a new reverend at the helm, Jim and his family left the country, first heading to British Guyana, which is located on the northeast coast of South America. History fun fact. In 1831, three colonies were combined to form British Guyana, which at the time was a British colony, but in 1966, it became an independent nation, which would then be known as Guyana. The Jones spent some time in British Guyana before heading to Hawaii. Jim and Marceline both loved Honolulu, so much so that Jim applied for a job at Church of the Crossroads. Unfortunately, he was not hired. So the Jones family headed to Belo Horizonte, Brazil, with a stop in Mexico along the way. And at first, Jim believed he might have found the right place for people's temple. But of course, he wanted his followers to relocate to another country by isolating them from their friends and family. It makes them that much easier to control. Jim and his family officially decided to settle in Brazil. And Jim was so confident in this move, he resigned as director of the Human Relations Commission it's amazing he was super confident, even after hearing that Reverend Winberg was making a mess of things back home. When Jim spoke with his close associates, they said Winberg was changing up people's temple structure and focusing his sermons on more traditional Bible-based preaching, as opposed to Jim's usual emphasis on socialism. Winberg also invited other preachers to give guest sermons, despite Jim's dislike of outside influences. And while the changes at People's Temple may have made Jim nervous, they didn't make him nervous enough to return home. He decided to stay in Brazil with his family and act as a missionary and eventually have his followers join him in Brazil. The thing is, at the time, Jim was just one of many white missionaries taking over Brazil, which made it difficult for Jim to be able to do what he wanted to do. Back at home, he gained a lot of followers through the temple's outreach programs, such as free food and clothing. However, in Brazil, Jim didn't have the money to make any of that happen. The locals were also wary of Jim, especially because he claimed to be a missionary, and yet he didn't own a copy of the Bible. Just a different style. Uh, after feeling like he wasn't making any headway, Jim eventually moved his family to Rio de Janeiro where he taught English at a school. Jim tried to impress the local government by raising money for an orphanage, but many of the locals were poor, so finding the money wasn't easy. But then Jim met, met a prominent diplomat whose wife allegedly took quite a shine to Jim Jones. According to Jim, this woman, I do not believe this, but this woman offered to donate $5,000 to the orphanage, but only if Jim slept with her. 
Oh boy. Okay. Jim claims that women had been throwing themselves at him for years, but he had always declined because he was a married man. Sure. But in this case, oh, damn, he really wanted to help those orphans, you know? So he spoke to Marceline and she agreed it was the right move. Jim then claims that he gave that woman so much physical ecstasy that she made the $5,000 donation. Those were his words. I'm so sorry. Gross. Uh, and it's a story that Jim would tell time and time again because he believed it showed his true dedication to the socialist cause. And look, I'll never know what really happened, but I don't believe for one second that Jim was some exceptional lover, mainly due to the stories that I'll get to later on. But his claim that she only donated money because he was so great at sex is laughable. Did she offer the donation in exchange for sex? If so, she would have paid regardless as to whether it was good or not. Also, Jim, bragging about that story is pathetic. You weren't dedicated to the cause. You were pretty woman. <laughs> I take that back. Vivian was actually good at her job. Well said. Thank you. Uh, the Jones family stayed in Brazil for a while, but Jim was never successful in setting up his own church. Reverend, Reverend Winberg left the temple in June 1963, and when JFK was assassinated five months later, Jim took it as a sign that America was falling apart and he was needed back home. So the Jones returned to Indiana in December 1963, where Jim went right back to pushing his apocalyptic vision that the end was coming. But now he said the attack would specifically happen in July, 1967. So in the summer of 1965, Jim led a caravan of 90 People's Temple followers across the country to their new home in Northern California. Well, 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 I, uh, I know we're just getting started. There's real, uh, real bulk of the story to come, but I'm already uh, transfixed and uh, preemptively horrified. Um, so let's take a quick break, grab another drink, hit the can, and we're going to be right back with more on this People's Temple episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Two on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to the People's Temple episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Before the break, Things didn't feel like they were getting too cuckoo bananas yet, and I got a feeling they're about to go from zero to 80. Uh, yeah, this is, we're going downhill now. Yep. At a remarkable rate. But, you know, is what it is. So, summer of 1965, Jim Jones and 90 members of People's Temple arrive in Ukiah, California, with the hope that they'd be safe from the nuclear attack that Jim had prophesied for July 1967. Once the temple members found jobs, they were expected to donate every spare cent to the church. Jim worked as a history and civics teacher at a nearby high school, and Marceline was hired as a health inspector for the state of California. Once everything was settled, another 50 to 60 members from Indiana made the trek to California. And even after they moved to what Jim claimed was a safer location, he reassured his followers he had discovered a cave in the hills north of Ukiah, and it, it would be big enough to provide protection from the nuclear fallout. He said it was deep and vast enough to easily accommodate all members, plus the supplies they would need to thrive after this alleged attack. The thing is, he never officially showed anyone this cave and kind of refused to give directions to the cave. So everyone just trusted that Jim was telling the truth. Even when July 1967 came and went with no nuclear attack, no one even questioned Jim about it. Now, the next decade of Jim's life can be grouped into four categories. Personal vices, the church money, and abuse. That's a horrifying round of Jeopardy, if, if I may. Yeah. Uh, 
So we're going to kind of flip a little back and forth in time, just because it's easier to understand some of these when they're grouped together. So first, we're going to focus on the church. As I mentioned earlier, revivals were a big reason as to how Jim was able to gain the massive following that he did. Yes, he did a lot of the right things that people, he said a lot of the right things that people wanted to hear. He was also charismatic and one hell of a showman. He raised his voice at the right moments to prove a point. He preyed upon people's fears of a potential nuclear attack to try and make them think that he was the only one that could make them safe. He leaned further into the fear by claiming the FBI and the CIA were secretly listening to their conversations and waiting for the right moment to strike. He talked about how the devil was everywhere, just waiting to send people down the wrong path. He said he believed that everyone should be treated equally, regardless as to skin color or financial status. He had the audience on the edge of their seats, hanging on his every word. Basically, he was a master manipulator, pulling the same bullshit that most politicians pull now to make people vote for them. Create fear and a common enemy and make the masses believe that your way is the only way that they can be safe. But something that also happened at these revivals were healings. At random points during the sermon, Jim would stop and call out to a random person in the crowd, someone who always just happened to have some sort of ailment. After a few words or after laying his hands on them, the person's ailment was gone. Sometimes it was arthritis or migraines or tremors or some sort of ache. And if the person didn't feel instant relief, oh, uh, well, that was their fault because they didn't believe hard enough. Oh, boy. There was a woman with cancer, which Jim claimed to have healed. When the woman's cancer got worse, she refused to seek medical treatment and instead just blamed herself for not praying hard enough. Jim's power over these people was intense and maddening, and I promise you I will yell about it later. So how did Jim know these people were sick? Well, before the sermons, Jim would walk around the crowd, taking notes on anything he overheard that he could use during his show. As his events grew larger, he had close members of the temple, uh, like Patty Cartmel, be his eyes and ears and get that info for him. But then there were times that Jim seemed to heal the impossible, like broken bones. There were times when Jim shamelessly faked the entire thing. Like when a woman in the crowd appeared blind and unable to walk, after a short blessing from Jim, miraculously, not only could the woman see, but she was also running up and down the aisles of the church. Turns out, the woman was actually just one of Jim's secretaries. Uh, then there was a woman who had a broken leg. Jim cut the cast off the woman's leg, and she was shockingly able to run around. The woman couldn't believe it. But the thing is, the woman's leg was never broken. One of Jim's cronies drugged that poor woman and put a cast on her while she was unconscious. And when she woke up, she looked at the cast, asked, obviously, what happened? People told her, oh, you fell and broke your leg. And she thought, oh, it was such a horrible fall. I don't remember it. It's because it never happened. Oh, my God. The people who Jim recruited to help stage the healings accepted their role as they were told it was all necessary to gain followers. And that while it may seem like a deception, it was done for the greater good. In the early 1970s, People Temple, People's Temple bought 12 older model Greyhound buses to use for the revival tours. Each bus was built to hold about 40 people, but they crammed 60 to 70 in each. The children were placed in overhead luggage racks, and some of the adults were left to sit in the aisles. Each bus was given two drivers who would take turns driving in four-hour shifts. When the other person wasn't driving, They'd be on a mattress in the luggage compartment underneath the bus. Oh, my God. Which feels, I don't know, terribly safe. 
so? Yeah. Ah, uh, but members willingly followed Jim around as he claimed to have the powers of God. Sometimes he used those powers to heal. Once he claimed he prevented a storm in Canada, he did not. He said he raised 30 people from the dead. Also, no. And then there was the claim he had literally walked on water. Nope. So if Jim had these godlike qualities and was able to do these amazing things, that meant him and his followers were free from senseless tragedy, right? Wrong. One night after a particularly long series of meetings, People's Temple member Joyce Swinney was driving her car around dawn, headed to her job in Ukiah. On the way, Joyce fell asleep at the wheel and ran into another vehicle, killing her instantly. When Jim announced Joyce's death, he outright blamed Joyce. He told his congregation that he had asked Joyce to meditate for two minutes before she left after the meeting. And she didn't. And she died. So, like, her death was totally her own fault. Oh, my God. But, of course, nothing was ever Jim's fault. Whatever didn't go his way, he'd make an ex excuse as to why it wasn't his fault so his followers wouldn't lose faith in him. Every negative, everything negative was someone else's fault, especially an outsider. Jim told all his followers that the U.S. government, the CIA, and the FBI were all out to get him. He claimed he'd been marked for death because they didn't want him to spread his gospel. But would someone really want Jim Jones dead? Well, in May 1972, during a potluck in the church parking lot between sermons, gunshots were fired. Jim slumped over, and one of his children's dogs ran toward a vineyard that was near the church. Jim miraculously got up and told his followers not to go in the dog's direction, but rather the other way. And then he slumped over again. Some members ran off after this potential shooter. Others were left to help Jim into the church. His shirt covered in blood. It had two bullet holes right at the chest. But less than an hour later, Jim was back at the church giving a sermon. He had healed himself. <laughs> His bloody shirt was shown to the congregation as proof of Jim's divine healing powers. But as you already know about Jim's powers, they were non-existent. The entire thing was faked by using blanks. And Jim purposely led the followers in the opposite direction so they wouldn't realize the shooter was one of their own. When chasing a bad guy, always trust the dog's instincts. Yeah. Jim later admitted to sending his followers in the wrong direction, but merely because he knew once they caught that shooter, they would tear him apart with their bare hands, and he didn't want the assassin's blood on their hands. More like Jim had a flair for drama and loved the attention that it brought him. Even Jim's son, Stephen, later said, quote, My father was starved for attention from a very young age, and it never let up. If nothing else, it intensified. In 1972, Jim opened temples in Los Angeles and San Francisco. At one point, the San Francisco temple burnt down. Jim used it in his sermons as an example of how everyone is out to get him and how the outside world is dangerous to people's temple. The reality is one of Jim's most loyal followers set the church on fire, most likely because Jim asked him to. He needed to make his followers believe outsiders were trying to attack them, which isn't a surprise since, again, he was a master manipulator and a liar. Which leads us to the second category of Jim's life, his personal vices. People's temple members were given strict rules. They couldn't drink, they couldn't smoke, do drugs, or have sex. TV and movies, off limits. Jim believed every minute not spent working for the church was wasteful. Although, without the followers knowing, Jim loved to sneak away to the movies. His particular favorites were Chinatown and M.A.S.H. 
Betty loved that Hawkeye. Uh, uh, But I'm not going to shame Jim for his secret love of cinema. What I'm going to do is shame him for his secret sex life. (laughs) I think that's fair. I think so, too. Uh, In 1969, Jim and Marceline had been married for 20 years. And for that entire time, Marceline had suffered from chronic back pain, something she'd been dealing with since her childhood. Sometimes her back got so bad, Marceline was confined to bed. Giving birth to Stephen really took a toll on Marceline, especially since Stephen was breech. But but after that, uh, Marceline told her family she and Jim were no longer able to live as husband and wife, a.k.a. sex was no longer happening. So Jim did what any supportive, loving husband would do, and he went and got himself a girlfriend. (laughs) Carolyn Moore was born in Sacramento in July 1945. She studied to become a teacher. While in college, she met Larry Layton. The couple were married in 1967, Carolyn became a teacher at a local high school, and Larry worked at a mental hospital. For the beginning of their marriage, the couple lived in Davis, but in 1969, they moved to Potter Valley, which is about 18 miles or 29 kilometers north of Ukiah. The couple then went looking for a new church when they found People's Temple and immediately became devoted followers. Soon after they joined, Patty Cartmel one of Jim's closest associates, approached Caroline, Carolyn, uh, and told her privately that Marceline was crippled with physical and psychological problems that were so bad that Marceline should be institutionalized. But Jim, oh, Jim was just too kind-hearted to allow that to happen. The problem was... In order for Jim to maintain his spiritual gifts, he needed emotional support and physical release. And sadly, Marceline was no longer able to help Jim with that. Patty told Carolyn that Jim had specifically chosen Carolyn to help him with that release because he believed Carolyn would, quote, provide the quality and devotion required. Oops. Gross. Oh, and by spiritual gifts, Patty meant the healings, which Patty knew firsthand were absolutely fake. But just to be clear, a 40-year-old woman asked a much younger woman to have sex with their preacher because he somehow required orgasms to do his job. And yes, I know that Patty was incredibly devoted to Jim and willing to do anything for him, but trying to pimp out Carolyn was not the move, especially when Carolyn declined and Patty kept telling her, oh, come on, Jim needs this. At the time, Jim was 38, Carolyn was 24. Ooh. It reminds me of those pricks in high school that would tell girls that blue balls cause them physical pain just to make girls think they have to blow them, which they absolutely do not. No. Also, at the time of the disgusting request, Carolyn was happily married to Larry. And it's even grosser when you remember that Jim used to forbid his followers from having sex because he told them a sexual relationship was selfish And it took away from one's commitment to the church. Jim, you're going to learn, is very do as I say, not as I do. It took Patty a few days of hard convincing, but Carolyn finally agreed to leave her husband and be Jim's new girlfriend. And while Jim didn't openly tell his followers about Carolyn, he absolutely told his children. In fact, Jim sat his kids down. The kids at the time ranged in age from 8 to 26. And Marceline, or he sat them down and said, well, Marceline no longer satisfies me sexually. So think of Carolyn as your special friend. Gross. 
Carolyn lived in her own house and Jim just alternated nights between her house and his own. So his wife absolutely knew what was going on. Yeah. And he just did it to her anyway. And I want to be clear, that is what I'm shaming. Because some of his other stuff I'm not shaming, but this stuff I'm specifically shaming. <laughs> I appreciate it and respect so, it. Carolyn would send letters to her parents telling them all the wonderful things about this new church and its charismatic leader. After not hearing from Carolyn for several months, her parents drove to Potter Valley, where they found Carolyn living alone. She told them she and Larry were getting a divorce and she was in love with Jim Jones. And from what I can tell... Larry and Carolyn were still very much a couple when that affair had started. And when Larry learned about the affair, oh, well, he was so devoted to the temple, he happily stepped aside. Larry soon married fellow temple member Karen Tao, who, spoiler alert, would also eventually become one of Jim's girlfriends. And yet Larry remained devoted to Jim. I can't. But speaking of other girlfriends, at first, the only woman Jim was sleeping with was Carolyn Layton. Their relationship wasn't public information, but for like the majority of followers, because, you know, sex was forbidden. But after two years, Jim decided, ah, Carolyn's no longer enough. Oh so he started looking at other women in the temple. In 1971, Jim started sleeping with Larry's new wife. Oh my Layton. God. Larry knew about it, accepted it, because it was good. If it's good for Jim, it's good for the temple. Only those closest to Jim knew about his extracurricular activities, and the only person who seemed upset about it was Carolyn. But Jim said, well, that's Carolyn's problem, not his. After Karen, Jim moved on to other temple members, saying he was doing it for them as much as he was doing it for himself. Oh, because these women, and this is a quote, no, needed sex with father for their self esteem. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> sex Where's with the soundboard? Where's the sex? <laughs> the, the sex board, the soundboard when we need it. Jesus, I know, I know. that uh, is the, vile. Sex with father is easily the grossest thing I think I've ever had to say out loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty up there. Yep, yep. Uh, oh, and remember those Greyhound buses they had where they crammed in way too many people on long drives? Well, bus number seven was Jim's bus. No. They removed seats from the bus to make a special private area just in case Jim needed like a place for a private conversation or quiet reflection. We're all adults here. We... We know what that really means. It means that Jim would bring young women into that bus, have sex with them, and act like he'd done them a favor. And sadly, sometimes that sex was actual, full-on sexual assault. 19-year-old Debbie Layton, Larry's younger sister, because he won't stop fucking with Larry. Oh my God, Larry, move on. It's insane. So Debbie Layton, was invited to ride in Jim's private bus compartment. Jim was 41 at the time. Again, Debbie was 19. She said without warning, Jim unbuttoned his shirt, unzipped his pants, and got on top of her. It was all over before she even realized what happened. Jim said, and this is another quote, I'm doing this for you, to help you. No. And also, quote, don't worry, my child. You needed it. This Barf. is nightmare fuel. Oh, this man is a horror show. Jim also allegedly sexually assaulted a 14-year-old temple member. Once her parents found out about it, they left the church. However, they didn't go to the police because they still believed in the cause. And they didn't want that to wreck the cause. Wow. Yep. Jim started going after so many young women that his closest associates, a.k.a. his inner circle of like six or seven people, had to create what they called a fuck schedule. Stop it. It was a notebook that listed who Jim was having sex with and when. And Jim didn't just go after women. 
he also made moves on the male followers. One follower who recently joined said he was shocked when Jim approached him and bluntly said, and this is a direct quote, ah, I'll fuck you in the ass if you want. That was oh. them that was them meeting in public after a sermon. Wow. The young man politely declined. Uh Jim said, quote, Well, if you ever want to, I can. I mean, to be honest, I'm just gonna put this out there, Jim. Uh any man could. <laughs> yep. Hey, hey, Jim hey. also refused to admit he was bisexual even though he very clearly was he went so far as to say everyone on the planet was gay except for jim oh stop jim oh he, come on he literally said that jim jones is the only heterosexual on the planet which is the most insane statement coming from a man who openly had sex with men yeah this is going to be a long episode. I don't have time to focus on this. <laughs> but my point is, he yes. uh, he slept around a lot. But, uh, and look, sleep with whoever you want, as long as they're consenting. But and also, of age and all of the above, yes. Correct. But also, you have a wife who loves you. Stop being a dick. Yeah. And I'll gross. Yeah. Anyhow. Then... We have 29-year-old Tim Stone, who graduated from Stanford Law School and went to work for the Mendes Mendes Ugh. Mendocino County District Attorney's Office. After Tim joined People's Temple, he would send any of his clients who had problems in their marriage or with their children to various programs at People's Temple. At this point in time, the temple had drug counseling programs, a health clinic, so it makes me want to say Jim was genuinely trying to do something good for people, but he was honestly trying to use those pro programs to pull in more people to his church. Basically, uh, whoever would ne end up depending on him was uh, his main target. When uh, Tim joined the temple, he brought his 19-year-old fiance Grace, with him. In 1970, Tim and Grace were married in the temple in a ceremony officiated by Jim Jones. Tim soon became Jim's top legal advisor. And then just as soon as Jim brought Tim into the inner circle in early 1971, Jim started sleeping with Tim's wife. There it is. Yeah. And soon, Grace was pregnant. And on January 25th, 1972, Grace gave birth to John Victor Stone. A week after John Victor's birth, Tim, Grace's husband, signed a statement that read, and I quote, I, Timothy Oliver Stone, hereby acknowledge that in April 1971, I uh, entreated my beloved pastor, James W. Jones, to sire a child with my wife, Grace, who had previously, at my insistence, reluctantly but graciously consented thereto. James W. Jones agreed to do so reluctantly after I explained that I very much wished to raise a child, but was unable after my extensive attempts to sire one myself. My reason for requesting James to do this is that I wanted my child to be fathered, if not by me, by the most compassionate, honest, and courageous human being the world contains. Given I what I've already... I don't I don't love the use of the word sire. No, <laughs> it's creeping me out. No, uh, given what I've already said about Jim Jones today, it probably won't come as a surprise that Tim later admitted everything about that statement was a lie. But Ugh. Jim had asked Tim to make the statement so Jim would be protected in case Tim ever tried to take the child away from him. And to be clear, Grace wasn't the first follower to get pregnant by Jim. Mm. She's just the first one that Jim didn't force to get an abortion. Yep. Because, you know, 
no one was allowed to have sex, so no one should be getting pregnant. But I guess it makes sense if this woman gets pregnant because she's married. So maybe stop it. So throughout the late 60s and early 70s, Jim was having sex with any People's Temple's followers. People's Temple followers, there we go, that he wanted. At first, he limited it to his inner circle, but eventually he branched out and started having sex with as many men and women as he could. So it shouldn't be shocking when Marceline returned home from traveling to inspect some state nursing homes for her work. When Marceline told Jim she'd fallen in love with another man, and she was leaving him and taking the kids. Good for her. Yes. Even though Jim was having multiple affairs, he still wanted to appear as though he was supported by his loyal and dutiful wife. And he was so possessive that there was no way he'd allow Marceline to be with another man or to take his kids. So Jim went to his children and said, Mom wants to break up the family. He told the children Marceline was putting her own wants ahead of what was best for everyone and that this man was going to take the kids away from everything they loved. Because Jim was a chauvinist prick, he only asked his sons what who they wanted to live with. The boys all said they wanted to live with Jim. Understanding Jim's games, Marceline said that she was just going to leave anyway and take the kids with her. Jim flew into a rage in front of their children and said, quote, if you ever take my boys away, you'll be dead. And with that, Marceline stayed with him for the rest of her life. Oh, my God. Yep. Oh, yep. Because she refused to leave those children in his care. And in the end, she cared more about those children than he did. But of course, I digress. Oh, so. At private temple meetings, Jim would often tell his favorite story, you know the one, about that time in Brazil when a diplomat's wife gave him $5,000, uh, uh, sorry, a $5,000 donation uh, to sleep with him. And Marceline, who attended those meetings, had to sit there and listen to it. And at this point, I've started thinking that Marceline might be a blanket girl. Uh, she got caught up with a man she couldn't escape, and he made her life Absolute hell. Absolute. After one of these uh, retellings, which happened after Marceline had threatened to leave, Marceline announced to everybody, quote, I agreed I would share him with people who needed to relate to the cause on a more personal level. This has been very difficult for me to live with, and it's caused me a lot of heartaches. But then she added, quote, I've been very selfish and I want to make a public statement tonight. I'm willing to share my husband for the cause, and I won't resent it any longer. Marceline then leaves the room. Jim laughs and says, quote, I hope Marcy's unexpected offer doesn't cause a lot of you to, being, uh, to start making demands on me. <laughs> I'm already overworked in this area. Disgusting. He is so fucking gross. He never deserved her. For example, Jim could sleep with whoever he wanted, whenever he wanted. But if he slept with a man's wife, that man was no longer allowed to have full intercourse with his own wife. One man said, quote, when we were in bed, I had to stop short of actual penetration. That was supposed to be Jim's privilege. It's, I can't. That's so gross. But then, in the summer of 1974, Jim's main girlfriend, Carolyn Layton, disappeared. Jim told his followers Carolyn had been sent on a secret mission that was crucial to the temple's existence, so she'd be gone for a while. Months later, Jim announced that Carolyn had been sent to buy the components for an atomic bomb. Because Jim believed if the church had a bomb, well, then the government would respect them and leave them alone. <laughs> Honestly, Jim, if the church did have a bomb, especially an atomic bomb, that's probably the moment the government would watch you closer. As opposed to... Yeah, that's going to put you on some lists. Yeah. 
But this man was delusional and a liar, and we don't have time to fully get into that. But Jim tells everyone, Carolyn went off to buy these bomb parts. But oh no, she's been caught and taken to a Mexican prison. Then magically, in the spring of 1975, Carolyn returned to the temple with a new husband and a baby. She was probably missing for, oh, maybe eight to nine months. Uh, but for whatever reason, oh, sorry. Uh, so husband and the baby, Carolyn and Michael Prokes had allegedly welcomed Jim John Prokes on January 31st, 1975. But for whatever reason, they never outright said that Jim John, who they later called chemo, they never outright said that chemo was Michael's baby. Instead, Jim told people that chemo was the unwanted baby of Carolyn's cousin. But then sometimes he told people the baby was the result of Carolyn being raped in that Mexican prison. <laughs> well, in, in some ways she was in a metaphorical in prison, but yeah. yeah, great call. Great call on that. Uh, according to Carolyn's father, who was a reverend, Carolyn contacted her parents in August 1974 to tell them she was pregnant and she needed to stay with them for a while. Her parents, of course, welcomed her with open arms, and as soon as the baby was born, Carolyn asked her father to perform a marriage ceremony between Carolyn and Michael Prokes. Carolyn told her father, Jim Jones wanted it that way. But I think we all know that Jim Jones was Chemo's father. I mean, she fucking named him Jim, but... <laughs> Neither here nor there. But why not just say Michael was the kid's father rather than claim that Carolyn had been raped? Well, it's probably because Jim didn't want to claim that his son belonged to another member of the church. And of course, at the time, Jim was still acting like he wasn't sleeping around, even though he absolutely was. But you know what else Jim was doing that he forbid his followers from doing? Just so many fucking drugs. In 1971, around the time he started sleeping with other with women other than Carolyn, Jim started using pretty much any pills he could get his hands on. Jim also only slept about two to three hours a night, so he'd take amphetamines to keep himself awake during the day, and then he'd take even more drugs to help him fall asleep at night. He was on so many drugs that his eyes were constantly bloodshot, which is why in later years he was always always seen wearing those dark sunglasses but if you ask jim about the glasses he'd say he wore them because the spirit of the lord was so powerful that if someone looked directly in his eyes they'd be burned on the spot stop it he just i Ugh. can't with this fucking dink oh god anyhow the drugs not only seriously affected his judgment, but they also caused Jim to get super paranoid. Jim would spout off conspiracies to anyone who would listen. He claimed the CIA and the FBI were tapping the church's phones and the government was planning to put all of the African-American people in concentration camps. Yep. In truth, he used the fears of his followers to try and make them even more dependent on the church and more distrustful of the outside world. And who they really should have been distrustful of was Jim's lying ass, which brings us to the section on financial shit. Jim founded People's Temple in 1955, and soon he started asking members to donate portions of their paycheck to the church. When Jim moved the temple to California, he pushed harder for member contributions. At first, he suggested 10% of the member's income but soon, he was asking for a bare minimum of 25%. Members gave up TVs, jewelry, furniture, even houses. No one was forced into it, but I think Jim had brainwashed most of them by this point. The members' items were sold in temple-operated secondhand stores. They also made money from a laundromat, a print shop, nursing homes, and a ranch meant for troubled youth. Jim also helped to raise money for the church 
by selling photos of himself. At five bucks a pop. Oh, boy. He made between two and three grand every sermon off photos. Jim also sold um, apostolic blessing plans, which for a donation of a certain amount, Jim would offer to include that person in his personal daily prayers. I don't know why I slightly went Southern <laughs> into a Southern accent with that, but oh God, it felt right. So in April, 1969, Jim had the temple treasurer, Eva Pugh, transfer all the money from the church treasury to an account that would only be used by James or Jim at his discretion. By 1975, there was a lot of money in the People's Temple accounts, as well as Jim's own private accounts. Around this time, Jim was setting up savings accounts under various family members. Marceline had personal accounts that totaled $200,000, although I am fairly certain she didn't know that. Jim's mother, Lynetta, had nearly $90,000 spread across eight different banks. Hmm. Jim also opened bank accounts in Switzerland under his name and his children's names. Later that year, Jim sent most some of his loyal followers, most loyal, including his lawyer, Tim Stone, to Panama, where they deposited large amounts of cash into new bank accounts. Members would tape bundles of money to their legs and attach the packs to their torsos with belts just to get through customs. They would also bring in items that they claimed were missionary supplies, but actually it was cash hidden inside. And since the uh, customs agents in the area were male, the temple members would use boxes of Kotex sanitary pads. So that the guards would be too nervous to open the box and too embarrassed. But in if they actually opened it up, it was it was full of money. In 1977, when Marcelin had to quit her state inspection job due to poor health, Temple members grew concerned for the Jones family as they believed that Marcelin's income was the only income that the family had. So once Marcelin was no longer working, the People's Temple Board voted to give Jim an annual salary of $30,000, which is equivalent to $150,000 today. And Jim, ever so bravely, accepted the money. <laughs> but financial weirdness wasn't the only shady thing going on behind closed doors. The members also suffered physical and psychological abuse at the hands of Jim and other members. Members who were deemed to have acted inappropriately were given a talking to and soon the punishment increased and people were verbally abused and even beaten with boards and whipped with rubber hoses. After a private meeting, a 15-year-old African-American member was surrounded by other members before being stomped on and beaten simply because the boy had talked back to an adult. Because all of Jim's meetings were recorded, there is recording of this child coming forward and being beaten by a room full of adults. You can hear Jim screaming and calling the kid, quote, a gangland punk and a motherfucker. One former member said that after getting his ears pierced, he was held down by members while they ripped the piercings out of his ears because he didn't ask Jim's permission to get them in the first place. And some may say, why didn't the members run once the abuse started? Probably because most had nowhere to go, but also because they were told if they left, they'd be hunted down and killed. In September 1975, Jim pushed the psychological abuse by randomly offering wine to his followers, which was odd because he was, didn't allow anybody to drink. But there was a small vineyard near the church, and even though... They weren't normally permitted alcohol. Jim, out of the goodness of his heart, decided his followers had earned a small gift. Once everyone had their cup of wine, Jim went, oh, 
by the way, it was poisoned. You have less than an hour to live. People started screaming. They were panicking. And then about an hour later, Jim went, oh, by the way, uh, there was no poison. This was a test. One follower said, quote, we proved we were willing to die. But what that night really proved was that Jones was considering the possibility that at some point he would kill us all. Which leads us to the beginning of the end. In the spring of 1973, Jim Jones told his congregation, quote, I know a place where I can take you, where there will be no more racism, where there'll be no more division, where there will be no more class exploitation. I know just the place. Except for six months, Jim refused to tell anyone where that place was. In September of that year, People's Temple Board of Directors authorized an investigation of developmental sites and locations for an agricultural mission. That was the goal, to be completely self-sustaining, you know, kind of exactly like what uh, Father Divine did over in Philadelphia. Uh, he wanted no need for anything from the outside world. Three weeks later, the board unanimously voted that Guyana was the most suitable place, so Jim was authorized to, quote, take any and all actions necessary or convenient to establish a branch of the church and agricultural and rural development in Guyana. Why Guyana? Jim wanted the new settlement to be isolated so that they could live in peace. What he really wanted was to get his followers away from America so that they were isolated and he could control them completely. Also, Guyana was the is or is the only country in South America where the official language is English. Jim outright told Marceline he was going to Guyana and he was taking their children with him and Marceline was staying behind to run the temple in California. Oh, wow. After everything she has done and sacrificed for you, you're telling her she has to be separated from her children? You selfish prick. Marceline's entire life was her children, so to separate her from them was incredibly unfair. Marceline asked for permission to see a psychiatrist. Jim granted it, and then the psychiatrist told Jim everything Marceline talked about. Wow. That's egregious. Right? Yeah. Uh, then Jim told Marceline's mother that Marceline was mentally ill, and the only reason they were still married was because of Jim's incredible compassion. Oh, stop. I can't with this fucking monster. I can't. In September 1972, the Examiner newspaper published an expose about People's Temple with the promise of publishing a total of eight articles, eight articles about potential fraud. Jim, of course, panicked and decided in that moment he needed to get out of the country. So he came up with the idea of creating a self-sustaining agricultural mission that would allow Jim and his followers to flee from the government and avoid concentration camps. There weren't going to be concentration camps, Jim, but, no. you know. So in December 1973, a five-person team led by Tim Stone was sent to Georgetown, Guyana, to speak with the government officials about making their own settlement. At the time, Guyana was having a hard time economically, so when a bunch of Americans showed up and offered to invest a minimum of $400,000 a year in their country and provide jobs to locals, the government was more than happy to welcome them. Not to mention, the Americans were going to help, without realizing it, with a kind of a territorial issue. Venezuela is a larger country to the northwest of Guyana, when Guyana became an independent nation, Venezuela started to dispute the border, believing the real border between them extended hundreds of miles into Guyana. And since Venezuela's military was large and well-armed, while Guyana's was not, there was concern that Venezuela may try to invade. However, if a group of Americans were to live in the area that was under dispute, eh, Venezuela might reconsider that invasion. So the government suggested that a spot for the People's Temple Settlement in a region about 190 miles or 306 kilometers from the country's capital of Georgetown. 
Jim wanted to lease 25,000 acres. The government said, let's start with 3,000 and see how it goes. Uh, they leased it for 25 cents per acre. The problem was the area was nothing but dense, dense jungle. So clearing it for the settlement would take a lot of work. In March 1974, half a dozen followers were sent to Guyana to get started with the hope the first settlers would be sent by August. However, clearing the trees turned out to be more difficult and time-consuming than they had planned. The trees were so thick and strong that chainsaw blades were shattering while they tried to remove them. Not to mention, there were wild animals and weather conditions that these people were not used to. By December, they had cleared and planted roughly 100 acres. When Jim came for a visit, he was disappointed to not see vast fields of produce. But when he returned to California, he told his congregation that there were vast fields of produce everywhere and even showed a photo of himself holding fruit in front of a field. What he neglected to mention was he had purchased that fruit from a market in town and just brought it uh, to the field for photos. The new settlement would be called Jonestown in honor of Jim, but to make it happen, they needed a lot of money. So Jim started pushing for donations at his sermons by asking for commitment envelopes. The follower would write their weekly earnings on the outside of the envelopes so the temple could verify that the donation was at least 25% of their earnings. Jim also asked all members to cash in their life insurance policies and donate their money to the Jonestown project. Oh, my God. Yeah. And while Jonestown was being built, things started to go pear-shaped in California. Grace Stone, who was considered by many to be People's Temple royalty for the fact of her relationship with Jim, you know, and she was also the mother of uh, Jim's son, John Victor, even if Jim didn't openly admit it. Uh, in the summer of 1976, Grace decided she needed out. And once the idea came, she had to get out fast or risk being beaten for disobeying the temple. So one night, Grace grabbed clothes and ran. But if Grace was going to get out, she wouldn't have a chance to get her son before she went. In the temple, the children were all raised together communally. John Victor lived with Grace for the first two years of his life, but after that, he was sent to live with a group of the other children. Jim had all temple members sign guardianship of their children over to the church so the kids uh, would be raised under equal conditions. After Grace left, Jim, who had previously not admitted to being the child's father, was now saying he intentionally got Grace pregnant because she had hinted she might leave and he wanted to keep her involved in the movement. And some people may say if Grace didn't feel safe, she should have taken her son and not left without him. I want to point out at that time, Grace's son was safe. Grace was not. Grace also didn't have access to her son, so she chose to go for the sake of her own safety and then use the courts to get her son back. After she left, Grace had to stay in hiding as members had threatened to kill her for leaving. And if that wasn't reason enough to fear the temple, during Grace's time as a member, Jim asked her to sign a bunch of blank pieces of paper. Afterwards, he turned those papers into letters that appeared to look like Grace was confessing to a multitude of sins, including molesting her own child and planning to assassinate the president. Oh, my God. None of it was true, but it was her signature on it. And Jim was just using these false confessions as a way to scare people into staying. Jim used the same tactic with other members who wanted to leave. When Yolanda Crawford left Jonestown, Jim forced her to sign papers claiming she was against the government of Guyana and a confession that she had killed someone and thrown their body in the ocean. Jim told Yolanda if she ever caused Jim or People's Temple any trouble, he'd take those papers to the police. And while Grace had left the temple, her husband Tim not only stayed, 
but he remained a devoted member. In fact, when Grace filed for divorce and requested custody of her son, Jim, or of her son, Jim sent Tim Stone and John Victor to Jonestown, believing that would protect him from the American courts. Jim also started sending more and more followers to Jonestown to help give the appearance that he was confident and in control. But Grace was determined to get John Victor back, and when Tim left the temple in June 1977, he was determined to help her. In August, Grace formally requested the custody of John Victor through the San Francisco courts, who gave Jim one month to show cause as to why Grace should be denied custody. Jim sent Debbie Layton to San Francisco with the purpose of finding Tim to bribe him into stopping the uh, custody situation. She was told, try 5,000, go as high as 10 if you need. Oh my Tim God. Uh, turned it all down. When that didn't work, Jim had dozens of his followers testify that Grace was inappropriate with her son and that she had tried to seduce some of the underage boys at the temple. Jesus. None of that, of course, was true. In September, instead of adhering to the courts, Jim told his followers in Jonestown that they were under attack. The people stood for three days, holding weapons and shovels, waiting for this big siege that Jim claimed was coming, but it never did. This fake siege was called a white night, and it was the first of many that Jim would pull over the next 14 months. It was always the same. People were coming to take the children away, be vigilant. They're trying to destroy our beautiful society. Sometimes Jim blamed the American government. Sometimes uh, it was mercenaries coming to get them. Sometimes it was former members. According to Jim, someone was always coming to harm them, so they had to remain vigilant. In February 1978, Jim used the speaker system to call his followers to the pavilion. He told everyone their enemies were coming, but they were going to rob their enemies of a victory. They all needed to take their own lives. People brought out buckets of Flavor-Aid, which is a cheaper version of Kool-Aid, and told everyone it was poisoned and they must each fill a cup and drink. He told them they would all be dead in less than an hour. Some drank willingly. Others had to be forced to do forced to drink by armed guards they were all assured their deaths would be peaceful an hour later jim announced bah there was no poison this was just a test and they all passed jim then privately went to the jonestown doctor and asked him to order one pound of sodium cyanide which cost about eight dollars and 85 cents at the time it was enough to make approximately 1800 lethal doses meanwhile back in america a judge officially awarded custody to grace and ordered jim jones to produce the child in court by october 6 1978 jim said quote i am keeping john not because i want to deprive her of him but because i believe she is deeply uh injurious to him because of her long history of mental imbalance Jim believed that as long as he stayed in Guyana, he'd be safe from the courts. Uh, a Guyanese court ordered Jim ordered John Victor to be or, or uh, the Guyanese court ordered Jim to present John Victor to a court in Georgetown, but Jim refused. The judge issued an arrest warrant, but the guards at the front gates of Jonestown refused to physically touch the warrant which eventually just got nailed to the gate. Jim believed uh, that if he left Jonestown, things would fall apart in his absence and John Victor would be kidnapped. So he knew he could never safely leave. So why didn't Jim just let Grace have her son? If he did, his legal problems would have gone away, but there was no way Jim was willingly giving up John Victor, not because of any affection for the child, simply because of Jim's need for power. John Victor at this point was a symbol. If he went back to his mother, it would show all the other temple members they could take their children and return to America. Jim refused to look weak or lose even the smallest amount of control over his followers, which led to the Jonestown Massacre. 
A year earlier, in October 1977, the father of People's Temple member Maria Katsaris formed a group called Concerned Relatives, which is exactly as it sounds, a group of people who feared for the safety of their loved ones who the families believed were trapped in People's Temple. The group's goals were to ensure there was no human rights abuses happening in Jonestown and that their loved ones were free to leave at any point. A month after it formed, Tim Stone joined the group and stepped up as leader. The group brought their concerns to California Congressman Leo Ryan for help. I don't have a lot of time to devote to Leo Ryan's background. Quick summary, born in Nebraska in 1925, served in the Navy during World War II, returned to Nebraska where he taught English and history at a high school. In 1956, Leo moved to San Francisco where he won a seat on the South San Francisco City Council. He remained in the role for six years until he was elected to the California State Assembly. The thing about Leo Ryan is he took a real hands-on approach when it came to issues. After the Watts riots in 1965, Leo moved in with an African-American family in the neighborhood to try and witness the living conditions for himself. He took a job as a substitute teacher at a local school to see what it was really like. When looking into prison reform in 1970, Leo had himself admitted to Folsom Prison under a false name as an inmate, and he spent a week there, living as an unknown inmate to see what conditions were like. So once an issue was brought to Leo Ryan's attention, he wanted to immerse himself into it to fully understand it. In 1972, he was elected to the United States Congress for California's 11th District. He continued that hands-on approach with issues, including a tri trip to Newfoundland, where he physically put himself between a baby harp seal and fur hunters. Wow, that's yeah. hot. <laughs> yeah, I get that. I get Sorry, that. I, I've, I've always sided on the side of the seals. Anyway, continue. <laughs> Look, I've always sided on the side of the seals is, uh, I'm going to say it. It's a great album name. Yeah. Just a thought. Just mm -hmm. a thought. So, oh boy. Uh, in 1977, Leo was contacted by an old friend named Sam Houston, whose son Bob had mysteriously died shortly after leaving People's Temple. Sam's main concern was he hadn't been able to contact Bob's ex-wife or the children who were living in Jonestown at the time. Between January and November 1978, relatives of people at Jonestown made 27 official requests to the American Embassy in Georgetown to do welfare checks on their loved ones. So when Leo heard from the Concerned Relatives Group, which now included Temple Defle Defector Debbie Layton, who uh, had described Jonestown as a prison camp atmosphere, uh, Leo knew he needed to act. On November 15, 1978, Leo arrived in Georgetown with his aide, Jackie Spear, a small camera crew, uh, a journalist, and four members of the Concerned Relatives group. Despite being members, Tim and Grace Stone did not make that trip. They had been told that their brains would be blown out if they ever set foot in Jonestown. The Jonestown settlement was situated about 160 miles or 257 kilometers from Guyana's capital of Georgetown. There were no roads in between, and Jonestown was so isolated it would take a 19-hour boat trip to get there from the capital, the quickest option was to fly to the small town of Port Katuma and travel from there. And while it started as an acres of jungle, the original Jonestown settlers had created a full-on community. There were cabins, a doctor's office, a pharmacy, classrooms, a large kitchen. And while People's Temple tried to publicly portray Jonestown as some utopian paradise, it was far from it. There were nearly a thousand people living in a place that was built for about half of that. There was not enough food or water. The outhouses were constantly crowded. Jim and his, his favorites, which included Carolyn, John Victor, and Chemo, all lived in a private cabin. 
that had better beds and a private bathroom and a generator that powered their fan and their mini fridge. All incoming mail was opened and read by a committee before being given to the intended recipient, and outgoing mail was censored. If the committee didn't like what someone had written, the person would be given their letter with changes and told to rewrite it. The horrific verbal, physical, and psychological abuses that occurred at the church in California continued at Georgetown. There was a punishment referred to as the box, which was a deep hole covered in a sheet of plywood. If someone did or said something wrong, they'd be blindfolded, told the box was full of spiders or snakes or something horrific, uh, and then they'd shove the person in and cover the top. Other punishments included being badly beaten, publicly humiliated, or outright buried alive. By this point, drugs had completely taken over Jim Jones. He was randomly urinating everywhere. His speech was slurred. And while it may be easy to think if things were so bad, why didn't people leave? Well, for them to come to Jonestown in the first place, these people gave up all their possessions and money, and Jim held on to their passports. So there's no way of taking a plane. The passports were all kept in a suitcase in Jim's private cabin. But everyone was free to leave whenever they wanted. It's just I have their passports. For safekeeping, I'm sure. Fucking dick. Yep. Not to mention, by this point, most of these people no longer had contact with their friends and family back home, so even if somehow miraculously they could get a flight, which none of them had access to money, uh, they would have nowhere to go. While some remained devoted to Jim and the cause, most of the followers were just outright trapped in a terrifying situation. Leo Ryan arrived in Guyana on November 15th, but Jim refused to let Leo into Jonestown. The U.S. Embassy told Leo he was on his own. Three days later, Jim invited Leo into Jonestown. But why wait those few days? Probably because Jim needed those days to coach his followers on what to say when they were asked about living there, as they would all give the same overly positive, clearly rehearsed answers. Jim also spent those days warning his followers that Leo Ryan was secretly a member of the CIA who was there to take all their children away. He wasn't, of course. If anything, Leo was actually coming to check on the well-being of the people there. So on November 18th, Leo arrived and Jim welcomed him with open arms. They had music, a full celebration, the atmosphere felt positive, and every Jonestown citizen gave glowing reviews of the settlement and everything seemed to be going fine until temple member vernon gosney snuck leo a note which said that they were being held there against their will and they needed help leo questioned jim who said everyone was free to leave to go at any time they wanted well if that was true then why was jim holding their passports so jim makes this whole speech about how if a follower wants to leave they absolutely can and 26 of them go, yeah, yeah, actually, we'd, we'd really like that, including Vernon Gosney, Patricia Parks, Monica Bagby, and super loyal follower, Larry Layton. Oh, oh my God. Who yeah, knew? Larry, Larry was Who still knew? there. Larry wow. was still there. Yeah. <laughs> how, many, uh, how many new partners of his did Jim have sex with this time? I Countless. do not. I do not believe that he ever... Uh, remarried after karen i wonder why i actually I don't even why. know if him and karen ever divorced to be honest well, there you but, go uh jim makes a big show of handing over the defector's passports to leo who is standing talking to people when temple member don sly rushes up to him grabs leo from behind and puts a knife to his throat thankfully in the moment leo was not badly injured but he took that as his moment to get the heck out of dodge as they were leaving the settlement, a man named Al Simon approached the vehicle carrying two young children. Al told Leo he wanted to leave and take his kids with him. Al's wife, Bonnie, ran up screaming that Al couldn't take her kids away. Al and Bonnie then physically pull back and forth on this child because, of course, there's footage of it. 
Um, Leo tried to help them come to a mutual decision, but they both refused. And eventually Al gave in and he and the children stayed in Jonestown with Bonnie. Leo Ryan's Land Rover left the settlement with the news crew and his aide, Jackie. There was another truck carrying the defectors. After they left, Jim warned his followers, if they take 20 today, they'll take 60 tomorrow. After a discussion with Jim, a group of 12 armed men, aged 16 to 56, hopped into a trailer, which was pulled by a tractor, and followed Leo to the airstrip. Jim then cryptically announced, quote, I think Larry Layton is going to do something. He's very loyal to me. When Leo Ryan's convoy reached the airstrip around 4.15 p.m., the twin otter plane that brought them there earlier was just landing. And thankfully, there was also a Cessna plane, which would be needed for the unexpected extra passengers. There was also a group of Guyanese soldiers who were guarding an inoperable military craft. Jackie Spear starts getting people into the Cessna, and defector Larry Layton was adamant. He had to get out, and he had to get on that first plane with Leo Ryan. As everyone was getting ready, a tra the tractor showed up pulling a trailer with armed men who just did a circle around the planes and opened fire. Multiple people were wounded. Some ran off to hide in the nearby jungle. A man in a red bandana got out of the trailer and, using a pistol, fired point-blank at victims who were on the ground including Leo Ryan, who was clearly the main target. As the gunfire went on, Larry Layton pulled out a gun and starts firing inside the plane. He shot Vernon Gosney and Monica Bagby before someone was able to get the gun away from him. Throughout the gunfire, the Guyanese soldiers chose not to get involved because they didn't want to get blamed because it was two sets of Americans going at each other and they weren't going to step in the middle of that. So they just sat back and watched horrified. But once the gun was taken from Larry Layton, the soldiers offered to take Larry to a local jail. Larry's plan was to shoot the pilot once the plane was in the air, causing the plane to crash in the jungle, killing everyone on board. Unfortunately for him, there were two planes, so he had to make a choice of which one to get on his mission was to ensure the congressman wouldn't make it home. Jim Jones told his followers the plan, but claimed, I didn't plan it, but I know it's going to happen. Bullshit. Every single thing that happened in People's Temple was planned in advance by Jim Jones. In the end, five people were dead, including Congressman Leo Ryan, Temple defector Patricia Parks, NBC soundman Bob Brown, newspaper photographer Greg Robinson, and NBC correspondent Don Harris. Multiple other people were seriously wounded, including Leo's aide, Jackie Spear, and Anthony Katsaris from Concerned Relatives. Back at the settlement, when the gunmen headed for the airstrip, Jim made a radio call to the People's Temple followers who were in Georgetown for a basketball tournament. This included... Jim's sons, Stephen, Tim, and Jim Jr., as well as followers Chuck Beekman and Sharon Amos. Jim asked to speak with Jim Jr., and he said, quote, you're going to meet Mr. Frazier. That was, quote, code for everybody go commit suicide. Jim Jr. responded, can't we do something different? And his father said, quote, avenging angels are going to take care of things. You've got to step up and lead on this. Jim Jr. and Stephen ran to the U.S. Embassy, hoping that someone could help them stop what was about to happen. But the embassy was closed at the time. When they returned to the house they were staying at, they discovered that Sharon, Sharon Amos, uh, who was in the room when that message was received, had taken her three children and her niece along with member uh, Chuck Beekman, into the bathroom and locked the door. There were horrific screams coming from the bathroom. Blood started coming out from under the door. But by the time these guys, who were I'm 18 years old, 
at the time. By the time they were able to break down the door, they discovered 42-year-old Sharon, her 11-year-old daughter Krista, and her 10-year-old son Martin had all died from having their throats cut. Sharon's 21-year-old daughter Leanne also suffered knife wounds to her throat and died soon after, but her niece, nine-year-old Stephanie, managed to survive. Chuck Beekman was found with a knife in his hand, but he claims to be innocent and that it was all Sharon. Chuck, who was described as an illiterate Marine who did as he was told, was arrested for the crime. Sharon Amos, I should add, was a trained social worker who once told Jim she would feed her children only bird seed so she could save extra money and give it to the church. Surprisingly, Jim had told her that was not necessary at the time. Around 4 p.m. on the camp loudspeaker, Jim's son Lou made an announcement that everyone was to join a meeting at the pavilion. When they arrived, Jim told them it was time for them all to die. But it wasn't suicide. It was a revolutionary act to deny their enemies a victory. The entire moment is horrifying, but what makes it worse is because it was Jim speaking, which means it's all recorded. You can hear people screaming, children crying. Jim, who is clearly so high that he's slurring his speech, he calmly tells everyone uh, that people were coming to kill them because of Leo Ryan, so they were going to take their own lives before someone else did. To quote Jim in that moment, quote, My opinion is we be kind to children and kind to seniors, and take the potion like they used to in ancient Greece and step over quietly because we are not committing suicide. It's a revolutionary act. We can't go back. They won't leave us alone. They're now going back to tell more lies, which means more congressmen. And there's no way we can survive. Things really amped up in that act. Uh, they did. <laughs> they really did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wowzer. Well, listen. There's more to come. Normally, Somehow. this is the point in the yeah. show where we take another break and then we come back and chat. But guess what? There's so much in this episode. It's so jam-packed. We're going to take yeah. one more break, hit the can again, grab another drink, and we'll come on back for some more in this People's Temple episode of True Crime and Cocktails. All right. Third clap. Here we go on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing People's Temple, the true nightmare human Jim Jones. Oh, my gosh. What is next? Well, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to be very blunt. This is the part where things get uncomfortable. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Jonestown children and seniors were brought to the front of the line. They were all given cyanide. The thing about cyanide uh, is the death is particularly gruesome and probably quite painful. It causes convulsions and foaming at the mouth because cyanide prevents the body's cells from absorbing oxygen in the blood. Basically, it's a slow suffocation. Oof. Jonestown nurses used syringes to squirt the cyanide into the mouths of the infants. Oh, the audio, because, of course, they recorded everything that anytime Jim spoke, the audio recording is truly the stuff of nightmares. Uh, people are screaming. They're panicking. Jim, in a very slurry voice, says, quote, die with respect, die with a degree of dignity. It's nothing to death. It's just stepping over into another plane. Don't be this way. He also said, quote, how very much I've tried my best to give you the good life. But in spite of all I've tried, a handful of our people with their lies have made our lives impossible. Jim also referred to the outside world as inhumane. But really, the only inhumane thing was how he forced these innocent people to die. Jim's wife, Marceline, just started full screaming. She was screaming, you can't do this. She had to be physically restrained and she struggled against those people and fought until the last child was killed. 
When Marceline starts screaming again, Jim tells her, quote, please, mother, don't do this. Lay your life for your children. Don't do this. I assume that was when Marceline was forcibly injected because you hear Jim say, Marceline, you got 40 minutes. Uh, it's also horrifying to think a lot of people think of People's Temple and think of this moment and think that Marceline was the loyal wife at his side, helping him do all of this. She most absolutely was not. She very much was a victim as well. And some of the followers were willing to take a part or take part in this supposed revolutionary act. But most wanted nothing to do with it. A small group snuck off into the jungle and hiked for 30 miles to safety. Uh, the people who remained either willingly drank flavor aid laced with cyanide or were forcibly injected with cyanide at gunpoint. It was a day before the Jonestown massacre was discovered. Uh, and by then, the bodies had been out in intense heat for so long that advanced decay had already set in. Some of the corpses had burst open. In total, five people were killed at the Port Katuma airstrip. Four, including Sharon Amos, were killed in Georgetown. And 909 people were killed in Jonestown. That number includes 304 children under the age of 17 Oof. based on the abscesses which were believed to be from cyanide injections it is estimated at least a third of the followers were forcibly injected and keep in mind that's not a third of that 900 that would be a third of the 600 because all of the children were forcibly of course given it uh, Jim Jones was discovered on a on the stage at the pavilion. His nurse, Annie Moore, was discovered in Jim's private cabin. Jim and Annie were the only people at Jonestown who died from a bullet wound to the head. Is it possible in the final act of defiance that someone shot Jim? His body was so badly decomposed that the medical examiner couldn't test for gunshot residue on his hands. Jim was one of only seven people who were given autopsies. The pathologist said Jim's wound was consistent with either murder or a self-inflicted wound. And while his death was ruled a suicide, it was stated that homicide cannot be entirely ruled out due to a lack of reliable information. A gun was found several feet from his body. I think it's also possible Jim witnessed the painful, horrific deaths firsthand and realized he didn't want to suffer the way everyone else did, and he chose a gun instead. Also, the uh, dogs and the pet chimpanzee at the settlement were all shot as well. Jim Jones told his followers, again, it wasn't suicide, and in most cases, he's right. Most of these people were outright murdered. And the ones who willingly drank the flavor aid had been so brainwashed by Jim, I consider their deaths to be murder as well. It was all senseless, a massacre caused by a man trying to exert control one last time. Due to advanced stage of decomposition, it took officials four and a half months to identify as many people as possible. In the end, 409 were unable to be identified. Wow. The bodies were taken to the Dover Air Base, uh, Air Force Base in Delaware, where they were either buried in a mass grave or claimed by family members. The unidentified bodies were buried at the Evergreen Cemetery in Oakland in May 1979. In 2008, two black granite mem memorial stones were placed with the names and ages of the victims. In May 2011, two more stones were added with the names and ages of the remaining victims. Controversially, Jim Jones' name is included on that memorial. His body was cremated and his ashes were scattered in the Atlantic Ocean. And one more thing about Jim very quickly, uh, before I focus on some actual victims. Uh, while his people were starving because they didn't have enough money and Jim was begging his followers to give him every dime they had so the settlement members could eat, 
It turns out Jim had a ton of money stashed away, including 635,000 US dollars in cash in his cabin. Stop. And uh, Guyanese currency worth $22,000 was found. And keep in mind that total of 657,000 is in 1978 which means that's equivalent to over 3 million today. Ugh. Also it was discovered there was over 8 million in various secret temple accounts worldwide. Again, that's 1978 numbers so that's closer to 37 million in 2023. He kept a secret ledger in a bible that listed all of these secret accounts. The Bible was never found after the massacre. My point is, if Jim really wanted to feed his followers, he absolutely had the means. But he simply chose not to. Why? To quote Jim Jones himself, quote, keep them poor and keep them tired and they'll never leave. So what happened to the survivors? In December, they were all able to return to the United States. The United States and the Guyanese government both agreed that someone had to answer for the 918 deaths. So Larry Layton and Chuck Beekman were both arrested. Chuck, who was with Sharon Amos when she killed her children, was sentenced to five years. After his release in 1983, he returned to Indiana, where he died in 2001. He was 65. Chuck's 37-year-old wife, Rebecca, and their 12-year-old son, Ronald, both died at Jonestown. Their 21-year-old son, Tom, survived the massacre as he was in Georgetown getting medical treatment at the time. At the airstrip, Larry shot two temple defectors who managed to survive. However, Larry was charged with murder, but then acquitted. Larry was extradited to the United States and charged with conspiring to murder a congressman, even though it was believed Larry was not the shooter, uh, I guess it was conspiracy, not outright murder. Uh, the first trial ended with a hung jury. The second trial, Larry was convicted. He served 18 years before being paroled in 2002. Congressman Leo Ryan's aide, Jackie Spear, was shot during the airstrip massacre. She laid on the ground at the airstrip for 22 hours before they were rescued. She was hospitalized for two months. She, after that, devoted her life to public service to continue Leo Ryan's work. She was elected to Congress in 2008, where she represented Leo Ryan's district. She officially retired in January 2023. Hyacinth Thrash was a temple member who was asleep at the time of the massacre. When members went in to check on her, they saw her laying there and just assumed she was dead. So they left her. And when she woke up, she came out to just bodies everywhere. And no clue of what was going on. I can't even begin to imagine how horrifying that is. Yeah. Uh, Michael Prokes, the man who married Carolyn Layton after she gave birth to chemo, uh, gave a press conference in March 1979 at a motel in Modesto, California. He handed out a statement uh, that defended People's Temple and Jim Jones. Then he walked back into his room and shot himself in the head. Wow. He was 31 years old. In Michael's room, police found other statements where Michael urged police to fully investigate Jonestown. Yep. I, it doesn't make sense. I know. Uh, Tim Stone tried to get back to a normal life. He spent four years as a corporate lawyer before working for a private firm. He unsuccessfully ran for the California State Senate in 1998. And in 2000, Tim eventually returned to the district attorney's office in Ukiah. In 2015, Tim released a memoir called Marked for Death, My War with Jim Jones, the Devil of Jonestown. Grace Stone has tried to live her life as far from the spotlight as possible since the massacre, Grace has remarried and has at least two children that I know of. And while I would like to honor the victims by saying their names and ages, as I usually do, 
the numbers here are impossibly high. So I'm going to just name the Jonestown casualties who have been previously mentioned in this episode, mostly for the sake of time, um, such as 49-year-old loyalist Patty Cartmel, 70-year-old treasurer Eva Pugh, 24-year-old nurse Annie Moore, and 76-year-old assistant Esther Mueller. The main reason uh, Leo Ryan got involved was because his friend was looking for his daughter-in-law and his grandchildren. And sadly, 34-year-old Phyllis Houston, 15-year-old Patricia Houston, and 14-year-old Judy Houston were among the casualties. The man who held a knife to Leo's throat, 42-year-old Don Sly, also died, as did 33-year-old Al Simon and his wife, 29-year-old Bonnie Simon, who were the ones who physically fought over their child when Al tried to leave. Their children, six-year-old Al Jr., four-year-old Crystal, and two-year-old Summer were also killed. The oldest victim at Jonestown was 97-year-old Amanda Poindexter, who had been living in Jonestown under the name Rejoicing Ever. The youngest victim was two-month-old Charles Gary Henderson. So what happened to Jim Jones' family? Jim's mother, Lynetta, died in Jonestown a year before the massacre. She was about 73 at the time. Ten members of the Jones family died during the massacre, including 47-year-old Jim Jones, 51-year-old Marceline, their 35-year-old adopted daughter, Agnes, and their 22-year-old adopted son, Lou. Also lost in the massacre were Lou's 24-year-old wife, Terry, their 19-month-old son, Chiuk, Jim and Carolyn's three-year-old son, Kimo, Jim and Grace's six-year-old son, John Victor, and Jim's longtime girlfriend, 33-year-old Carolyn Layton. Sandy, the 22-year-old wife of Timothy Tupper Jones, was also killed in Jonestown, as was 20-year-old Yvette, who was not only the wife of Jim Jones Jr., she was also pregnant at the time. And Jim Jones Jr. was 18, 19-ish at the time, and he was one of the people who tried to get back to stop it. But of course, it's such a long trip, they never would have made it. Suzanne Jones uh, had left People's Temple around the same time that Grace Stone did. While Suzanne would talk occasionally with Marceline, she refused any contact with Jim. Suzanne died from breast cancer in November 2006 at the age of 54. 19-year-old Stephen Jones, uh, the only biological child of Jim and Marceline, uh, spent three months in a Guyanese jail while officials figured out who was responsible for the deaths of Sharon Amos and her children. Chuck Beekman, of course, eventually was blamed and Stephen was released. Stephen, Jim Jones Jr., and Timothy Tupper all moved back to the States to try and rebuild their lives. Timothy died from a heart attack in April 2019 at the age of 60. As of 2019, Stephen works for an office furniture company and he is married with three daughters. As of 2018, Jim Jr. works in healthcare and is married with three sons. When asked about his father, Jim Jr. said, quote, the mental illness was exacerbated by the drug abuse and the absolute power when no one challenged him. When you put that cocktail together, the mind can spiral out of control, and that's what Jim Jones did. He spiraled out of control and self-destructed. The thing that comes up time and time again with Jonestown is that people want to know why so many followers went through with it, not unlike the victims of Heaven's Gate, the victims and even the survivors of People's Temple get called crazy and they use the phrase, don't drink the Kool-Aid. It's become, you know, some sort of sick joke. But these people were human beings looking for a better life and a connection with another person. They were lost souls who wanted to belong to something and make a difference in the world. And it may have started innocently, things quickly devolved as Jim Jones craved more and more power and eventually many of the people were stuck and simply had nowhere else to go. 
So to Jim Jones, the mass suicide was a revolutionary act that would go down in history. But to the rest of the world, it was a senseless, senseless sa slaughter of more than 900 human beings. While Jim spent years telling his followers the government and other outsiders were the enemies, in the end, the biggest threat to People's Temple was Jim Jones himself. Reporting for True Crime and Cocktails, I'm Christy Oxborough. Wowzer. Yeah. Wowzer. Yeah. Well, listen, I'm going to go through my thoughts very quickly. Sure. Um, you know, it's it's shocking to me the early part of this, because there is, I, I know a lot about this case, but obviously there was a, a lot that I learned from your impeccable research. I, it's so sad that he started out so well. The details at the beginning where it was like, yep. they actually did a good job. They actually were helping people. It wasn't just a scam. Like they really did seem to be doing what they claimed. Yep. It's so sad to go from that because again, quite often when we hear these stories, uh, the, the intention is never actually there. And it feels like at the sure. beginning of this, it was. And that's yeah. just so tragic. <laughs> um, the idea that uh, in this story you were talking about uh, the Father Divine marrying Panina to stop the rumor mill that he was sleeping with younger girls and then saying, oh, actually, this is still my wife when it was absolutely not. Mm. That is... I don't marrying know an older say. woman to hide the fact or to to pretend he's not sleeping with younger women and then she dies and he absolutely marries a super young woman but then also pretends like it's the whole pretending the young wife was the new was the old wife exactly that for me i was like just stop it you piece of trash i know and it's funny because I wrote down at that point, this guy reminds me of Joe Francis, which of course was last week's episode. And then multiple times in this case, talking about Jim Jones, there was so many similarities to me about different specifics. And then the specific, when you said Jim Jones had his own bus and he took girls on there and sometimes not only had sex with them, but also se sexually assaulted them. I was like, the parallels between the two of them are wild. It's crazy. These were the episodes that happened to be back to, back. to have to be back to back. Like it's, yeah. it's just, I don't know. And in many ways, even though Joe Francis has not killed anyone as, as far as we know, it's still that cult leader kind of vibe, yeah. right? Um, so charismatic, but also completely brutal. Um, yeah, it just really shocked me that, that twice I was like, oh, that reminds me of Joe Francis. That reminds me of Joe Francis. And then the similarities just kept flowing mm -hmm. um it's so interesting to me that jim jones seemed to have this real white savior complex from like very early on even when he was yep. doing legitimately good things he was always focused on the black community the black community the black community yep. and i'm not saying that that's bad it's not it's wonderful but it was just interesting to me that that seemed to be where he was focusing his energy and then, well, I mean, we all know how it turned out. Um, and then at the end, when you brought up your comment, the comment of his, the quote of his about keep them poor and keep them tired and they'll never leave. I was like, was he deliberately targeting marginalized communities because oh, he felt like those were easier targets for him? Um, was he trying to make himself look like a savior to those communities so then he could pull them into his web? It oh, feels I'm like sure it. there has to be some sort of correlation because it just came up again and again and again. Yeah. And the intention, if it was a pure intention, is right, is wonderful. Yeah. But it just, to me, given everything, I was like, I feel like that's that was calculated. Oh, 100%. Yeah. He knew what he was doing. The statement that you made that really chilled me, and you're going to love this because it's not going to be what you think. Sure. You were like, you know, you were talking about how he was doing these fake healings, right? Yeah. And it was it was all necessary to gain followers. And it just made me think about the current world we live in, yep. where virtually everyone, not everyone, but virtually everyone who engages in social media cares about their followers, wants yep. to get followers. Um, certainly for people who it's a part of your job, it's not even that you necessarily want it, it's that you kind of need it. And this sure. concept, again, anything to gain followers, it just like kept, it kept like bumping me throughout that I was like, isn't that an interesting parallel that this was a cult leader who murdered 
900 plus people. Yep. And the drive in some ways has been programmed into all of us in a similar way, not to kill. But you know what I'm saying? That it's like, this was so extreme that he was willing to do anything to get people to follow him. And then the yep. literal parallel now that it's like, the things that people will do to get to get followers, oh, whether it's yeah. exploiting yourself, exploiting other people, trying to jump on trends, trying to seem relatable. It just felt like yeah. it was hitting me in the face how this new social media culture is kind of almost pushing us to be narcissists sure. in ways that in, you know, the 70s would only have been associated with men like this or people like this. Yeah. It's like that girl who claimed she was Madeline McCann. Yes. And her family was like, she wants attention. And she said, all she wants is followers. And her accounts went up. Millions. Hundreds of thousands, millions. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, of course, in the end, she's not. She's no. absolutely not. She put that family through something she shouldn't have. 100%. Because absolutely. she wanted followers. And there's a difference between like, oh, I'm going to post some some harmless content and hope that people follow me and like it and i'm gonna you know say that i am a deceased girl from one of the biggest true crime cases of all time to get followers obviously yeah. there's a very large spectrum and chasm between those two things oh yeah but it's interesting to me that when you distill it down it's the same concept oh 100 percent. and again that is a concept that 30 or 40 years ago was afforded to Oh my God. I just thought that the 1970s was 30 or 40 years ago. It's oh, 50. Bless you. It's over 50. Let's not even think about it too much. Anyway, no, you're doing I just thought that that was like an interesting, like sociological concept that I hadn't really yeah. thought of before until I heard the words. Um, him having someone shoot him so he could heal himself. That's some fucking snake oil salesman shit that I've never even, I didn't remember that detail. When you said it, I was like, oh yeah, that sounds familiar, but that's, wild mm. yeah then i wrote down sex with girls in a bus this is joe yeah joe uh, then i accidentally wrote down joe jim 41 debbie 19 but it's again it's such a parallel yeah. um don't worry my child you needed it oh. and the detail that his associates created a quote fuck schedule yep that's their words not mine i yeah exactly Although that's probably what i would have called it <laughs> I mean, all of this, the, the, it's also so interesting to me that he was like, I'm the only heterosexual person on the planet. Everyone else is bisexual. Was that yeah. in order to make them think that they should all have sex with him? But then also he was having sex with all of them. So that, yeah. I don't know. That's a very fascinating detail. Um, oh God, there's so much here. Uh, <laughs> You, the dark glasses. I also think of do the dark glasses with David Koresh. It's what is what is it with these cult leaders and their tinted tinted lenses? I don't know. I mean, well, in this case, uh, hide his massive drug use. Well, yeah, exactly. Um, the fear of Kotex. I just wrote down. I was at Disneyland yesterday, and I opened up my backpack, and there was so many tampons, and that man almost threw it back at me. He was like, "Yep, yeah, thank you." <laughs> Searching my bag. Thank you. Uh, it's so pathetic to me. <laughs> That's true then and true now. <laughs> um, again, then this detail that this black child was beaten by this room full of adults. Again, this is our white savior. This is the guy who all this time has been championing all these black causes. And then that happens. Yeah. Proof, absolute proof to me that it's like, nope, this was all, none of that was real. Even when it felt like it was rooted in altruism at the very beginning, it wasn't. Um, the detail that he would give them stuff to drink and say it was poisoned when it really wasn't is so chilling. I did not know that detail. That is so chilling. It was basically like him trying to get them to trust him that they would always do it. So then oh, when he, he sprung it, it would happen. He absolutely just wanted to see how many people would, how many times he could do that and people would stay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the detail of Marceline asking to see a psychiatrist or a psychologist and him saying, okay. And then making the person tell him everything yeah. just broke my heart. I mean, all of her story breaks my heart, but like, 
the idea that you would be asking for help legitimately and then be betrayed by that way by a, no. by a therapist is just it's so bleak mm-hmm. um cash having people cash in their life insurance policies to give the church unbelievable and here's my question him hoarding all that money what was he going to do with it did he think he needed that much money for drugs because it wasn't exactly like he was living a lavish lifestyle i understand that he was living a better life than the other people that were in jonestown yeah. but he wasn't living like it wasn't like he was in a mansion what was he doing with all that money and well, what did he uh, think it was going to be his drugs he was just taking them from the pharmacy from the jonestown pharmacy and having his doctor bring them in it's so sick it feels like it really is just that statement that he made which was basically keep them poor keep them tired and they'll follow you forever like how disgusting um especially uh, yeah it's just so many children it's so hard to even think about uh the the statement take the potion potion you're not harry potter 100 percent um yeah and then i i then i just wrote down what happened to grace's son and then you said and i was like of course that's such a tragedy too that she legitimately went through all of the proper channels to get that child out of there and failed like the system is broken it's broken uh and then the final thing i just had to comment very quickly hyacinth the woman who who slept through a mass suicide i'm not laughing because it's uh, funny and I'm not trying to be glib but it's just the idea of how insane that must have been like I laid down for a nap I woke up and everyone had killed themselves like or or yeah. had been forcibly killed like I mean it just must have felt like such a um, Armageddon type moment you know what I mean such a dystopian 100%. like am I dreaming is this real yeah wild because the, the bodies were just everywhere of course and also it was no they nobody could make it there for a day so she lived there for a day i uh, i can't and she had no like she had no way to go out get out she had nothing it's i hope that she received help i really do i hope that she got some help because that's such a level of trauma i can't even wrap my head around oh i i I think I would be convinced in that moment that I never woke up. Yeah. That you were then trapped in a nightmare forever. Yes. Yeah. Oh, 100%. 100%. Um, my God, what a slog. Christy Oxborough, oh. amazing research as always. This was truly incredible. And again, as someone who really felt like I knew everything about this case, I was proven wrong, as you always do. And that's a joy for me. It, uh, I'll say it, it was unpleasant. Yep. (laughs) I think I might have been okay. I mean, the whole thing and the child death the most uh, was not great. I might have been okay if they didn't record everything. If there wasn't audio recording that I heard, um, which uh, uh, many, any listeners who are going to watch the documentary that I recommend for this Mm -hmm. uh, will also hear parts of it. Um. That documentary is executive produced by Leonardo DiCaprio, who is currently in talks to play Jim Jones in a biopic. And to Leo, I'd say, sir, stay on your yacht. We don't want it. Nobody needs it. And I'm not saying we don't want you in a movie playing him. We don't want anyone playing him or in any way trying to glamorize what that fucking monster did. So I don't I think-, think, yeah, I'm I'm kind of getting over that genre of true crime i i have to be honest i just think it's an odd it's odd enough that we as a society love true crime as much as we do and this is coming from someone who hosts a true crime podcast (laughs) but the the dramatization bits where we're then portraying the person by famous actors i'm like you know that you're giving them exactly what they wanted right like these true full-blooded narcissists like like legit They check off every box like there's nothing that Jim Jones wouldn't want more than to have one of the biggest movie stars in the world play him in a movie. That would be the biggest other than I think for if it was Jim Jones or a true narcissist, the only person that they would want to play them more would be themselves because they 100%. are possibly impossibly uh, delusional yes. and self-involved. 
But again, I, I, yeah, I just don't know that this is a story we need to see dramatized. Oh. I think that the documentaries are important. I think it's important to remember these stories in the hopes that we will not repeat them again. I think it's important to yeah. honor the victims. But do I think that we need to make like a major motion picture where we show the deaths of 900 people? I don't. I really don't. Because also, how are they going to pull that off in three hours? Because you know it's going to be three hours. They're always three hours. We barely got through yeah. this in three, three hours. Yeah. No, it's a lot of information. It is. And, well, that's when you start cutting corners in those scripts. That's when details get lost. You know, all of the above. I just, yeah, yeah I think that, that this is one for me that I'd say, no, thank you. Pass. Yes. yes. And I'm especially, because I have concerns I don't want to know how they're going to portray Marcelin. If they try and make it seem like she was super involved in those deaths, I will rage. Yeah, that's so She was sad. trapped and she stayed to be with her children. He would have let her go. He tried to force her to stay behind, but she was like, I'm going where my kids go. Yeah, it's so dark. He didn't deserve her. No. I stand by it. Well, listen, Christy Oxborough, truly fantastic work. We are so grateful to you always. And this one, you really went above and beyond. So thank you so much for all you do. Thank you. I'm happy to be on the other side. I think we all are. Yeah. And thank you, dear listeners, for joining us on this dark journey. Um, <laughs> we so appreciate you uh, listening and supporting us. If you haven't already, give us a follow on the socials on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at True Crime and Cocktails, on Twitter at Not Detectives. If you'd like to learn more about Patreon, go to patreon.com slash True Crime and Cocktails to see everything that we have going on over there. And the only place for official True Crew and True Crime and Cocktails merch is, of course, truecrewmerch.com. So check that out as well if you're interested. Christy, do you want to tell the people about next week's episode? Oh, I I think you'd like that honor. I absolutely would. <laughs> On the next True Crime and Cocktails, The X-Files Uncovered. That's right, dear listeners, my favorite television show of all time. I will be taking a handful of episodes breaking them down for you, giving you behind-the-scenes looks into what happened on those episodes, and then telling you the real-life stories that inspired them. I am jazzed. I'm jazzed! Couldn't be happier. It's going to be a real romp and a half. Uh, Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Since I'm already depressing everybody for the last two and some hours, goodnight, Treat Williams. Oh, goodnight, Treat Williams. <laughs>